Hey, Mark, thanks so much for having me. Well, as, as you shared, um, I am an executive coach. I am a serial startup person, uh, <laughs> a 14 year veteran of eBay and two time cancer survivor and new uh, book author of the Cancer Channel. You talk about what are the things that you don't say to someone who's been diagnosed. Now, now I'm guessing because you know you're very vivacious and out there and a spokesperson and you, and you worked with customers, so you were out in front of people all the time. So I'm going to guess that 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 you're just your natural personality to talk about this was uh, I, was it muffled or stifled or did you keep it inside just on your own at the beginning? You know, I think what is curious is I, I'm a very public person. I, yes. I, you know, I'm an open book, so to speak. Um, but when I was first diagnosed with my first cancer, uh, salivary gland cancer, which is a super rare incurable cancer, when I was first diagnosed with that, I uh, was strangely muted. I felt embarrassed. Um, kind of ashamed, even though I knew I hadn't brought the cancer on myself, huh. but I wanted to keep it super private. I uh. didn't want anyone to know. And as I've reflected on it since, I think a lot of that has to do with, I was in a very, you know, I was in an executive role at eBay. I was a very hard driving individual. I was afraid to be perceived as weak. Mm. I, mm. or I, and, and there's also something kind of embarrassing about talking to people about your health, especially when it might involve your decline and death. So mm. there was just a lot around it that I initially could not get my head around and could not comfortably talk about. Oh, and then add to it the fact that I was completely freaked out. And I sure. didn't know if I would, if in talking to somebody, if I would lose control and start sobbing. So I kept it super, super private. And then um, when I received my second um, unrelated cancer diagnosis, and I realized, wow, um, you know, cancer is coming after me. Yeah. And um, I realized at that point, I was going to have to take time off from work and I was going to need to go through chemotherapy. My second cancer diagnosis was breast cancer and uh, it was stage three. So wow. there was lymph node involvement. I was told, hey, listen, you're going to have to do some pretty serious chemotherapy. And I thought, well, I'm going to be bald. I am not going to be able to hide this from anyone. And at that point, I became very public about my diagnoses. What, what were the initial reactions like? And, and I'm curious, in, in talking to other people, because you, you've become an advocate now for communication, right? And um did you learn something or was there something different? I know the situation caused you, but that made you rethink your initial decision to be quiet. Yeah, initially I thought I would speak with all of the important people in my life one-on-one -on -one about my cancer diagnosis. And I was about a month into that systematically going through all of the friends and family who were kind of part of my inner circle. And I had a very close friend pull me to the side um, when I was talking to him. And he said, oh, Jesus, God, you're not going to talk to each person individually, are you? And I said, well, that was my plan. And he said, you know, it's going to quickly be overwhelming, especially when you need to update people on what's going on. And he suggested that I set up a Caring Bridge blog. Uh, oh. And so Caring Bridge is this great site for people who are in crisis who want to communicate out to everyone what is going on. And it allows you to alert everyone that you're on Caring Bridge. And when you post a journal or blog entry, people are alerted that there is an entry that they can go read. And it became, mm. it was a terrific vehicle for me uh, to be able to tell people, especially when it, when it was difficult news, um, people could go read about it and then contact me if they wanted to hear more as a as a writer and someone who's studied writing and as someone who myself just lives in the world of storytelling um how how did storytelling 
help you navigate? Well, it's you control the message, right? You tell people how to think about it. And that was super, super helpful because when I was initially trying to tell people one on one, the reactions were, you know, all along the spectrum. And I found I was having often to um, help other people process my diagnosis, which might include really, really, you know, fear, anger, um, mm. and, and, you know, gosh, that was a lot for me to deal with when I was just trying to deal with, you know, moderate my own emotions about it. You know, I had a lot of people saying to me, tell me it's going to be okay. And I said, you needed to I, comfort I, them. <laughs> exactly, Mark. And so, so what was helpful in doing the storytelling uh, was to tell people how to think about it. And it was so, I found writing the blog, it was so much fun. I mean, sadly, I was writing about cancer, but it, but it was a chance to be playful. It was a chance to, um, I don't know. It, it was just a lot of fun. And that blog actually became the inspiration for the book I wrote. Got it. I... <laughs> Did it surprise you? It surprises me that you needed to be the rock for your friends. I don't think that that is unusual. Um, oh. now talking about talking to other people who have been diagnosed, often people look to uh, the person who has been diagnosed to have all the answers um, for, for any health crisis, you know, because they're the ones talking to the doctors all the time. But what you need to remember is often the person who's been diagnosed is you know physically and emotionally and mentally and spiritually processing their diagnosis and their treatment yeah. and especially if the prognosis you know um isn't clear uh right. it can be really really that's a difficult thing to to process and to share with others you you have me thinking about a a parallel issue with covid you know, over the last three years, it was, you know, we, we've been dealing with cancer and then we, now we have COVID come in and it, it has subsided. Yay. I don't have to wear a mask most of the time anymore, but I'm, I'm concerned and we're going to have a couple of conversations in the, in the upcoming months here about long COVID and yeah. people who are dealing with the, are going to deal with this for the rest of their life. And to your point of they, your friends come to you as if you have the answers because, you know, for some reason you do. And or I'm aren't. talking to the doctors more, or yeah. or maybe I'm researching it more. You know, I mean, cancer or you know, you name your health crisis. Right. Uh, each one it has its own language. Like one of the interesting things is you know, with cancer, unless you have had someone close to you who has had cancer, you don't understand all of the language that people are talking about. Like I, I have had people say, oh my God, it's rare and incurable. Does that mean you're going to die? You know, and that's a very fair question, right? And I, I said, it is rare. Rare means there are very few people who have been diagnosed with it incurable means they don't have a cure but that doesn't mean we don't have treatments and you know I, it, as far as like do, am i going to die uh, it, spoiler alert we are all going to die yeah i'm hopeful that it is not soon i am hopeful that it is not one of my cancers <laughs> what are so let, I want to get to the um, the five things not to say to someone, and uh, I'm I'm curious how, like, how did you figure that out? Was that one of your blog posts you were you were writing? Like, oh man, if I get asked this question again, or someone says this, did that this organically come about? It it came about um, from people that like one of the top questions that I get from people uh, now as somebody who kind of wears the cancer mantle is, um, oh, Jesus, Sarah, a friend of mine just got diagnosed. What do I say? Mm. And so many people are afraid to say anything because they're terrified of saying the wrong thing. And, and, you know, I kind of enumerated a couple of things you shouldn't say, you know, um, just to kind of make it playful and fun for people. 
and or explain to them why a particular phrase or sentence wouldn't land well. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the top one that I would say that that people with cancer get all the time is, how can I help you? And th the intention mark is terrific. It's it's a friend or family member or coworker who says, I, I want so much to make it better. How right. can I help? Right. What is challenging about that is the person who has been diagnosed with, you know, whatever health issue, the person who's been diagnosed says, I have so many things that I am in charge of right now that I am managing mm. and adding you to that list and helping to make you feel better it is tough. So what, what, what I say to those well-intentioned people, instead of saying, what, what can I do? Give me something to do. Um, is I say, suggest to them, tell them what you can do. And an example would be, um, you know, maybe it's somebody in the neighborhood. So you say, uh, can I walk your dog? Can I get your kids to school? Um, if it's a friend, can I drive you to and from treatment? Like, can I go with you? Um, or if you, if you just don't know, um, hey, I'd like to bring some ice cream by at two o'clock today. Does that timing work? Because, you know, ice cream heals all wounds. Of course. Yeah. In my case, it was, uh, I cooked for a woman who had gotten, uh, she had stage four. Uh, she had 12 weeks. Yeah. And, um, and she was just great to just, you would never know. Yeah. And um, I was making soup for her and her friends. And I just loved, I loved doing that. And her husband said one day as, as he was walking me out, he says, you know, your soup is keeping her alive. And I was like, okay, great. That's to, to your point, the, the one thing that we could do, what is, what's the, I, I have a little bit of time. What, what, what's the thing that you hear it and you're just, you just kind of internally, you shake your head and you're like, come on, yeah. really? Uh, cancer picked the wrong person. They what, tell you that. Yeah, they say, you know, uh, <laughs> you got this. Cancer picked the wrong person. And I, I see this on Facebook and the various really? socials. <laughs> where what people are trying to do is cheerlead and say, you got this. Oh. But that is hard when you're the person diagnosed because you're like, I really don't got this. Right. I really don't. Right, and right. I would like cancer to pick someone else. Not that I'm wishing cancer on other people, but just like, like, I don't got this. So please, please don't make me out to be a hero. Please don't make me out to be this superstar because I'm none of that. I am somebody who is terrified, terrified. And so, you know, Mark, the advice I give people, if people take nothing, nothing else from this talk, the two sentences to say to somebody who's going through a crisis is i am so sorry you're going through this mm. it must be hard and that's all you need to say i am so sorry you're going through this it must be hard and the person who receives that if it is given authentically and with care what they feel is seen the person understands that what i'm going through is tremendously hard and they feel bad that I'm going through it. And that's all I need to say. And then you just kind of create that resonant space to hold that person, which is making me sound very woo woo, but that's what we all need. Yeah. We need people to check in and tell, you know, tell us that they care about us and that they're willing to sit and listen and that they recognize that what we're doing is really hard. Sarah, thank you for that. Uh, those two sentences are going to just stay in my head. Thank you so much. Thank you.